him at one stage with his daughter. His daughter asked him when he could see the, when she could see the photographs. And he said, uh, you will see them in a week or two because they've got to go back to Kodak to be developed. And we've got to wait for them to be posted back to us. She said, daddy, why can't I see them now? Great question for an inventor. And within 48 hours, he penned the Polaroid instant film uh, system. He only brought it to market later, but he had actually penned it. And in 1963, he brought it to market. And this became Kodak's biggest competitor when it came to instant imaging. And it in actual fact, created one of the biggest um, uh, you know, um, lawsuits in the, in the history of, of not only photography, but in the world where Polaroid sued Kodak and Kodak lost and Kodak had to retract and take back all the cameras they manufactured where they had basically stolen or infringed the rights of Polaroid. That was the first time Kodak nearly went under. And then we get to ourselves, and this is uh, where things become quite fascinating. We get to ourselves, electronic capture and the digital imaging. Now, you know, I'm, my daughter's involved in photography and, uh, and she exhibits as well and she loves every moment of it. But she missed this whole era of film and developing and all of that. And she's quite sad about it, but she missed it. And, and even for her, when she now, she's now shooting on film because she finds it fascinating and she can have it developed now for the first time. But she was born into the digital film art of photography and never really came into contact uh, with film photography. But you must remember that if you're going to learn about photography, digital cameras were actually born out of film cameras. Digital technology was born out of film technology. And you will see how they're very, very similar. But digital photography was born in this we saw back in already in 1975. And I want, uh, there's one, one guess who pioneered this, and you would be right if you said Kodak. The great giant Kodak pioneered digital photography. And the reason for it was simply because the film uh, manufacturers, the likes of Kodak, Akfa, Fuji, Ilford, um, Konica, all of these great uh, empires of film manufacturing companies and, and paper manufacturing companies of photographic material were using more gelatin than the food industry. Now, gelatin is an animal byproduct. It's made from the, from, from the slaughtering of animals and uh, slaughtering of cows and, and using the hooves of the cows. Gelatin is what is known as the perfect binder in photography. And it was used in the manufacturing of film and photographic sensitive paper. And silver gelatin, or sorry, a light sensitive silver was suspended in the gelatin. And that was then used to manufacture the film itself. And they could already see there was a problem coming because sooner or later they were going to either run out of gelatin or they were going to be questioned by the world at large. And so we started to see this going through and Kodak pioneered digital as an alternative form to film uh, to uh, gelatin photography. Here's our hero, this is Steve Sasson. This is the very first digital camera ever to be manufactured. Kodak manufactured this. And although Kodak pioneered the digital camera, the product was dropped in fear that Kodak would actually lose all of its business. So although they got the technology to work, they hid it in a cupboard and waited for a rainy day. Well, unfortunately, that was the demise of Kodak because it wasn't long after this and with industrial espionage, uh, Kodak found themselves on the back foot because the company called Fuji got hold of the patents and actually manufactured the first digital camera. Here's the first commercial digital camera that was ever brought onto the market. Some of you may recognize the stiffy disks that came out with it, but uh, this was brought out by Fuji and for even a day, Kodak were running behind. Kodak also pioneered the first 10 million pixel digital camera. It looked like this, but they could never manufacture the cameras themselves. They had lost their marketplace share and they got Canon and Nikon to manufacture their cameras for them. All they supplied was the digital technology inside the camera. And so if any of you want to know why Nikon and Canon is so powerful today and why you see them as brand leaders, it's because Kodak ran to them cap in hand and asked them to manufacture cameras for them. Kodak then went later and felt that there was no pressure from technologies, uh, emerging or competing technologies, and the executives at Kodak couldn't fathom a world without traditional film. 
this was taken out of the boardroom notes. Well, it wasn't long after that, and they filed for bankruptcy. The greatest brand in the world fell from grace, and in, you, you, and <clears throat> I think they sold their patents for a measly amount of money, and that was the end of Kodak. So we're going to go into some interesting facts now, but what I'm going to do is just stop share for a moment and just see who is still with me. So please, guys, you're welcome to switch on your, um, your cameras if you can, and you are welcome to ask any questions at this point. So I have rushed through the history of photography for you. I have only taken little pieces out. There is so much more behind this fascinating art form, and, uh, and you will see that as we go in, into taking photographs now and as we actually move on with, with, with how to actually get into photography and how to get started to shoot great images. So I hope somebody has got a question for me. Or an observation. Good. Elizabeth, are you wanting to ask something? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Elizabeth from Devon View. Yes, uh, yeah, I enjoyed uh, the history of camera um, uh, of photograph Martin. And now, as you conclude the history, I actually enjoy the last part where you spoke about um, Canon and Nikon being the, the in the photography world. Mm -hmm. And if one is considering of having a camera, I've always seen that being a problem. If I'm to ask you, which one would you recommend? Uh, which brand would you recommend, given an opportunity to choose on the cameras with the same aspects and no. the same? Yes. Great. Question. With this, uh, <laughs> you can put in the hot seat straight away. You work for Nikon, Elizabeth? No. <laughs> so, okay. Sorry. No, I said, do you work for Nikon or Canon? I'm, I said, you get put in the hot seat straight away. Okay. I... No, it's, I'm just joking. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. So my answer to you, I... if everybody, I don't know if everybody heard the question, but the, uh, the question is basically Nikon, Canon are very strong brands. Uh, is there a band that I would prefer to actually recommend? So first of all, I'm going to say, start off and say, no, there isn't. And there's a reason why I'm going to say that. Also, you, uh, you need to understand that for many years, I served as a Canon ambassador. So uh, then I would be, I would have had to say Canon, but now I don't need to say that anymore. Um, so my, my point mm -hmm. is, is very clear. Today's cameras, whether it is, and, I, and I'm looking at the top end brands now, so whether you're looking at the Nikon, the Canon, uh, or the Sony, those brands of cameras are incredibly good. The quality of the cameras are good. And I can promise you now that if you took a camera system and went and shot some images and put them side by side, nobody would tell the difference. The only thing that you would tell the difference is the quality of the lens itself. So, so if, if your lens quality is good, a, a equal quality of lens, you're not going to tell the difference in the images. So for me, I would rather have somebody go around to, the, to a photography shop and physically pick up the cameras in the budget that you are going to be spending, physically hold them and see what feels good to you, weight-wise, size-wise, but as long as it's one of the decent brands. And I think you will be fine with that. You'll see later that photography is actually very simple. So it's got very little to do with the camera you own and a lot more to do with, your, um, with how you feel about the camera you own. So I'll, I will talk about that in a moment. Are there any other questions? No? All right, let's hope it, uh, it hots up a little oh, bit. Sorry, I do have one if that's okay. With the, with the, with the mirrorless cameras, um, Fuji seems to be coming up. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I failed to mention Fuji, um, but Fuji is also an incredibly strong uh, camera brand. So Fuji, Sony's, Nikon's, Canon's, uh, you're not going to go wrong. Sorry, did uh, Bill, did you have a question? Um, yeah, it's actually just related to that in a way. I guess from your answer, I guess you would say the same thing about full frame versus micro four thirds or... Yes. APS SC centers. Yeah. Exactly. So when I'm when I go into the the third session as we progress, I'm going to give you oh, some sorry. Yeah. aside. I'll, uh, we'll get to that for sure. Okay. Great. Thanks. And then I know somebody else had a question. Uh, I heard uh, somebody else ask. No. 
Okay. All right. I'm going to share screen with you now and we're going to continue. Um, in this next uh, part of the session, I just want to start to look at uh, tips and hints on, on, um, on, getting into, on getting in and learning photography and being able to actually um, photograph properly. So I'm going to share screen again with you. And if I could, uh, let's just see over here, if I could just ask you to mute your microphones and uh, let's continue. So just some interesting facts as we progress. And uh, those of you who are just getting started, you may find this quite interesting. Uh, let's push play. It'll help if I push play, so, right. Right, so first of all, photography is based on science, maths, and chemistry. So you need to understand that, there's an, that there is a, a, a strong technical um, control that needs to come through. So photography has been developed by scientists and mathematicians and chemists. So one almost has to, has to understand that as you get into photography. But then let's not forget, it's an incredible creative medium. And I think that's what makes photography so special is the fact that it's a, a reality-driven medium that is built out of a mathematical, a math, a mathematical, scientific, and chemistry approach, and yet it is technical, but it appeals to the creator. Why am I saying that's important? Because some people can understand the, the operating of the camera and the photographic process itself, but may battle creatively to create interesting pictures. And other creative people may very easily be able to create creative pictures, but battle really heavily with the, with the, with the, the um, sorry, I just want to have a look here. Okay. And battle really heavily with the, with the technical side. So, so it's a marriage of the two and it depends on, on what you need help with, uh, with how you're going to go forward. It, has progressed from film to digital. I've been fortunate enough to, uh, that, that I have seen in the, from pure film to not even knowing that digital was gonna be an option all the way through to digital where film now is really on the back foot. And I've seen the transition and I've seen how the photographic process has adapted. But we, you, you will see later, it's important to understand that digital photography is actually born out of film photography. Everything we know about digital photography, everything we know about even the developing of pictures in the, in, in the, um, on the computer has all come out of how we used to do things in the darkroom. And I will share that as we go along. And today you cannot deny its popularity. I mean, if you, if you were able to wake up George Eastman uh, just for one moment and say to him, do you know today over 130 million, if not more today, posts on Instagram, not even counting Facebook, of pictures have been posted by people around the world who have loved this medium you have introduced to us in modern photography, not even he would believe it. Not even he would believe it. So it is, it, from that point of view, it is an incredible popular and interesting medium. But unfortunately, this is one of the reasons why I do these talks. I often notice that people getting into photography are fed either the wrong information or understand or are led to believe the wrong information as they get into photography. So I wanna just clear up a few myths with you this evening. The first thing is, in order to shoot good pictures, and Elizabeth just hinted on this now when it came to a choice of camera, you need to have an expensive camera. Now you must remember I own a gallery and I show my work in a public space. And what happens in a public space when you put your work on the wall for everybody to see, even in a gallery where there's light music playing, people tend to talk a little bit louder than they should. So you sit in the gallery, they don't know that you are the photographic artist behind the pictures and you hear them speak. And they'll speak to one another and one of the things will come up, wow, the quality of the pictures are incredible. You must imagine how expensive this equipment must be. And that is a myth. It's not about expensive equipment. It's got very little to do with that. Yes, the quality of the lens is important, but besides that, it's not about expensive cameras. It's a complete and utter myth. And uh, another one that comes up is you need to shoot with a lot of megapixels in order to enlarge large pictures. Well, the good news today is that that's not entirely true. The good news today is that the sensors that you get with your camera 
already have sufficient pixels in them to create wonderfully large enlargements. And there's and the software we have, the interpolation software, to to enlarge pictures from a reasonably high size to an incredibly big size is wonderful. And uh, we don't have a problem when it comes to having to have megapixels to create quality. Another one that we get is that in order to, to take great pictures, you have to be able to use Photoshop. Photoshop is almost used as a swear word in photography today. So again, people will come into our gallery, they'll walk around, and when they know it's your picture, they will look at you, and some of them will have the guts to ask, and they will look at you and they'll say, has this been Photoshopped? As if Photoshop is this great big enemy of mankind. Well, the fact is that all pictures have to run through some software to be realized in any case. And the most recognized software is Photoshop. So Photoshop is a wonderful program, but it's the modern darkroom. So it's the same for me as somebody in the day of film photography, walking in, looking at your picture on a wall and saying to you, was this picture developed? Of course it was developed. If it wasn't developed, you can't see it. So Photoshop for me is, 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 is part of the actual deal and the software we'll talk about later when I give you some advice on that. The other thing that, that uh, happens when it comes to photography is people believe that you have to travel to great photographic locations in order to shoot great pictures. Well, that too is not true. There's an acre of diamond in our own back garden. And if we can get to see pictures and use the camera correctly, you can create the most brilliant things in and around your home, let alone, leave, let alone having to leave home. So it's not about these things. What is, what's more important is that you have a camera that works, a camera that offers you a reasonably good quality, that you can shoot with a reasonable amount of pixels, and that you can learn the digital photographic process that you can develop your photographs into full reality. And then you have to develop a creative eye that you can actually see photographs wherever they are. These things are more important than anything else. So we're gonna be heading into a break in a, in, in a while, but just a few things to think about. The first thing is people say that a camera never lies. And I think this is one of the things that stops people from being creative in photography. They believe that whatever the eye sees, the camera should be able to record. Well, that is not true. And thank God for that. The camera cannot do that at all. There's this wonderful saying that says, now listen to this. I photograph things because I like to see what things looked like once photographed. Now that sounds absolutely silly. I photograph things, why? Because once I photograph them, I like to see what they look like once photographed. Now that is a true statement because the fact is that your picture will change when you take photographs. You will change. And these are the things that are going to change whether you like it or not. Some people get very frustrated when they get into photography because their camera is not showing them what their eye is seeing but it was never intended to do that. When you compare what your eye sees, humanly speaking, to what the camera records, just the fact that you're choosing a lens to photograph through introduces two elements to us. One element known as compression and the other one is distortion. So the stronger your lens is, the more it compresses backgrounds and middle grounds into your picture. And the wider your lens is, the more distortion you start to introduce and perspective changes. Just the fact that you're changing lenses is gonna alter the reality in any case. The fact that you can freeze motion at a moment's notice and you can blur motion if you so choose, and I'll show you examples of this later, also changes it from the way the eye sees. The eye cannot freeze and the eye cannot blur, but the camera can. The camera introduces an element of depth. This is known as depth of field, or sometimes when you're teaching it, it's known as the dreaded depth of field, but it's an element of two-dimensional depth in a three-dimensional scene. So the camera allows you to change the depth, foreground, middle ground, and background, and you'll be able to change from areas of focus to out of focus at will. This allows you to change your pictures to be creative either way. So if you're shooting a landscape where you want the stones in the foreground and the horizon in the background all to be sharp, or whether you're shooting a creative picture where you only want a little sliver of focus, you'll be able to do this with the modern camera 
well, with any camera that has a lens on it. And you'll be able to do that using depth. Human eye does not do that. The big one, however, is contrast. This is an amazing one. And I also find it quite crazy that it's not often taught. But contrast is the ability of the eye to be able to see detail in shadowed and highlight areas. The human eye has an incredible wide range of contrast control. 